welcome to Ask Kate, brought to you by the Children's Tumor Foundation. My name is Kate, and I am a registered nurse. I've been working with CTF for about eight years in patient support and education. The best part of my job is hearing from the NF community, and I really love speaking with you and hearing your stories and finding ways that CTF might offer support or guidance along the way. Today, I want to talk about a conversation I re recently had with a mother whose young daughter with NF1 also was diagnosed with an optic pathway glioma. Before I get into her question, I want to talk a little bit about what that is, and then we'll, we'll get to what she was calling specifically about. So an optic pathway glioma is a benign, uh, low-grade astrocytic tumor that grows on the path between the eye and the brain. We see this most commonly in children under six years old with NF1. We see it about 15 to 20 percent of kids in that age range with NF1 uh, will develop an optic pathway glioma. So that is the age where we are looking most carefully and monitoring most carefully when it comes to vision. Uh, we recommend a yearly ophthalm um, visit with the ophthalmologist to assess for just healthy eyes and healthy vision. And of course, always encourage parents to report any changes in vision to their NF doctor. So after about the age of six, we start to worry a lot less about these tumors. It's exceedingly rare to see them pop up in older uh, children or adults with NF1. We also know that uh, in a lot of cases, we will identify the tumor and we will not see any changes. Vision will stay normal. Uh, the tumor will not grow in size or change in any significant way. Uh, personally, I've seen children where these tumors get smaller without any intervention or treatment uh, and they don't become um, anything that needs to be addressed medically. And after, again, about the age of seven or eight, we start to worry less, um, even with existing tumors, that they will start to cause problems. Although monitoring is still exceedingly, extremely important anytime we're aware of a tumor um, for anyone living with NF1. So having said kind of all of that, the reason this mom was calling was because she was asking me specifically about uh, treatment options. So they knew in her child's case that there had been vision changes and that the tumor had been identified. And so those are kind of the two things that a lot of clinicians will look at. And I'm going to be real honest with you that there is some debate in the medical world about when is the best time to intervene with treatment for children with NF1 and optic pathway gliomas. We're looking at the tumor changing size over time. We're looking at visual acuity any changes in the ability to see and how a child is functioning. Those functional outcomes are very important when we're making decisions about uh, treating one of these tumors. And so taking those things into account, her team had advised that it was time to consider treatment and we're presenting her with two options. The first being the traditional chemotherapy that's used for op kids with NF1 and optic pathway gliomas. It's been sort of the standard of care for probably 15 years uh, with uh, fairly good results. Again, anytime we're dealing with uh, tumor growth in NF1, we know that each case is unique. And so we can't, um, there's no cure for these tumors. There's not something out there that we know 100% every time is going to take care of it. But traditionally, this chemotherapy has been what's used. The other option was to consider a clinical trial use of a MEK inhibitor, selumetinib. You may recognize that name if you're in the NF1 world as also the uh, name of Kelseligo. It was recently approved for the treatment of plexiform neurofibromas in children with NF1. We're now looking at selumetinib as an option for other NF1-related tumors, including optic pathway gliomas. So mom and I were just talking through sort of, you know, what is there an advantage one way or the other? And so a few things that we discussed that might be helpful for others, if you ever find yourself in this position, um, are that it's, it's important to consider your family life. Okay, this is a mother who has multiple children at home, young children. So traditional chemotherapy would involve the placement of a port and then infusions at a prescribed rate of how many weeks, every few weeks they have to go in. There's a protocol for that. Um, and then receive that treatment. And then considering all of the side effects that are possible with the traditional chemotherapy. When we look at the MEK inhibitor, advantage being it's a, it's a pill, it's an oral treatment. It's not something that you have to have a port placed for. But we also know that there are side effects when it comes to selumetinib in children. And I have spoken with parents whose kids are on it for quite a long time to manage their plexiforms and are experiencing some side effects, but that are very manageable. And I've spoken to parents who they had to choose to stop treatment because the side effects were really just not manageable at all at that point. 
And so again, I had to talk with mom about, you know, you, you don't know for certain what side effects or how any treatment is gonna impact your child. Um, and so just taking that into consideration and asking those good questions and saying, okay, let's say if we chose selumetinib and then the side effects were just too much and she wasn't tolerating it, what would be the next step? Right? And so I just encouraged her to talk with her treatment team and to remember that all of her questions are valid and that it's their responsibility as the ones in charge of her child's medical care to make sure that she and any other adults involved in her child's care were fully informed and knew exactly or understood to the best of their possible ability um, all of the choices that were being made. Hopefully this is helpful. Optic pathway gliomas are certainly something that's talked a lot about in the world of NF1. I'm sure there's a lot more I could have said and didn't. Please feel free to leave your questions below or reach out to me. My contact information is always included with these videos. Thank you for joining us and I'll see you next time on Ask Kate.